Hi, welcome to the second video of the electricity revision series for the IGCSE uh, course. We're going to continue where we left from and we were looking at this uh, PowerPoint presentation here and going back between the my, my explanations on the other sheet and here to, to go through this topic. Okay, um, hopefully we'll go through a few things in this video, not only these learning objectives here. So uh, we'll deal with these as um, swiftly as possible because we have already done a few um, presentations of, of this particular part of the topic and it should be quite intuitive for you and easy to understand, hopefully. Okay, so in the first part we'll look at current as a rate of flow of charge. Rate of flow is a really important idea I've uh, mentioned this already uh, quite a bit, where you should have in your head the idea of rate of flow as, as one of the main ideas that you've learned over the last two years uh, in your GCSE course, or one year if you're in year 10, because the rate of flow or rate of change, depending on what you're looking at, are all over the place. The rate of change of distance with respect to time is called speed. And if you give it a direction, then it's called velocity. We always use the, the V normally, though, for the symbol, even if it's for speed. The rate of change of velocity with respect to time has a name also. It's called acceleration. The rate of change of energy or rate of, of use of energy with respect to time is called power, measured in watts. Acceleration is measured in meters per second squared. Velocity is measured in meters per second um, and pertaining to this particular topic the rate of change of charge or rate of flow of charge per second per unit time as all of these you can see they're all per unit time this we call current and charge carriers you should know are the electrons which we have humans have called negative the opposite charge to them are carried by by protons and also positive quarks and things like that and they they are um, positive in charge which are opposite we know opposite charges uh, attract and like charges repel now I mean said all of that about the rate of flow there's other many other rates of flow in physics that we use and rate of change that we use but it's important to understand that they're always with respect to time rates of flow it's how fast something is changing with respect to time they all have different uh, names and different meanings but the idea is the same, a very, very important idea that needs to be understood in physics uh, well so that we can solve questions involving that. It's interesting that if you multiply any rate, a change of color so it's not so boring, if you multiply any rate by, by time, you get the absolute value. So for example, current, which is a rate of change of, or rate of flow of, cur of charge with respect to time, if you multiply that by time, so a question says 3 amps are flowing through a circuit for 4 seconds. Find out how much charge flows through a point. Then 3 amps times 4, which is this, the amount of time, will give you 12 coulombs, which is the unit for charge. In other words, if you get the rate and you multiply it by the amount of time, you can get the full amount of flow. Similarly, if you have a rate of change of distance, which is velocity, right? Somebody tells you that you, are, you have a velocity of 20 meters per second and that you're doing that for 10 seconds and they ask you how long, uh, wha how far you've traveled and you do 20 times 10, you get 30 meters, which is your distance. So you get your distance back. This was rate of change of distance with time and when you multiply by time, you get back a, a distance, 30 meters. This was rate of change of charge with respect to time. And when you multiply by the time, you get back the total charge. Same with velocity. They ask you, they tell you there's an acceleration of 4 meters per second squared. During 10 seconds, right? How much does your velocity change? Well, 4 times 10, 40. So your velocity has to change by 40. It could be increasing or decreasing, depending if this is positive or negative. But the change in velocity would be 40 and so on and so forth. Whenever you multiply a rate by time, you get the absolute value of the change. And that also can be seen from the just the normal equation. If you look at, for example, acceleration, that's change of velocity over time is equal to acceleration. 
so if I want to know the change in velocity I just have to bring the t to the other side by multiplying both sides by t and I get a times t so it comes out also from the maths it's not only um, from from common sense it comes also from the maths really maths is an expression of common sense if we do it properly so that should be uh, not a very big surprise that they agree okay The electrons are the charge carriers, as you should know, in electrical circuits. The protons are stuck to the atoms, and the atoms are vibrating around in the material of the wire, or whatever it is that the current is going through. So they don't move around. The protons stay there in the nucleus, and the electrons move around, and they are the charge carriers. We also want to identify the, the, the equation of I is equal to Q over T, which I just talked about a little bit. So it says, uh, current is the rate of flow of charge, how much charge flows in a certain amount of time. It is measured in amps. One amp is equal to one coulomb of charge passing a point every second. So that current is equal to charge divided by the time taken. I is equal to Q over T. So if this is my wire and this is my light blue current, God knows why it's that color, then however much in coulombs is passing a particular point per second, that is what we call current which has a unit of amps okay my pen is a little bit too fat not to discriminate against fat things uh, hopefully that makes sense now let's go to the next page and see where where we are so there's a couple of examples here 10 coulombs of charge pass a point in five seconds what is the current well my equation is i equals the current divided by time and they ask me for the current so I don't have to change my equation at all they tell me the charge is 10 coulombs and the time is 5 seconds so I can just say well 10 divided by 5 is equal to 2 and that has to be in amps that would be my answer easy busy second a current of 3 amps flows for 10 seconds how much charge flowed past each point so each point will see 3 coulombs per second during 10 seconds, you multiply them and you get 30 coulombs. That's how much goes through each point. That's the example that I just went through of multiplying the rate, which is this, by the seconds and you get the total quantity. How long will it take for 100 coulomb of charge to flow past a point when the current is 2 amps? So now they're asking a different thing. They just ask us first for the current, then they ask us for the charge and now they're asking for the third element, which is the time. The equation is again i is equal to q over t but i need to move it around because they're asking me for the time so i multiply both sides by t to get i t equals q you can also look at it as moving the t up on the other side and now i want the t alone so i've got the i that i want to move i bring it to the other side dividing or i divide both sides by i and now i look back at my question it says 100 coulombs flow into um, in a, in, in a, at the rate of 2 amps so 100 coulombs flows at the rate of 2 amps means that the time that this is going to take these coulombs are going to take to flow if that is the rate is going to be 50 seconds that's how much time they will they will take to flow through any point in the current there in the wire they're all flowing at the same time right around the wire so at, at this point the flow is the same as this point, at this point, that point, and that point. All of them the same, unless it's a part of the circuit in which here they divide and we already talked about that before. Great, so those were a couple of examples of, of uh, calculations you can do with the equation i is equal to q over t, which is up here. And we move on to a uh, new learning objective. It says, explain the term potential difference. Explain how potential difference behaves in series and parallel circuits. So now we start to think about volts, potential difference, uh, and EMF and things like that. Let's have a look at the first slide. Potential difference is not only something that exists in electrical currents it also exists in gravitational fields here there's an initial gravitational potential which means that the plane is at a certain height 
and then when it lands in the airport down here on the floor it has a, a final potential uh, energy and between here and there there is a potential difference and that is what we mean by by that word we mean that the difference in the pot and the energetic potential between one point and another point and that happens as much with gravity as it happens with electricity between two points in a circuit but there needs to be a drop in between similarly with circuits if I have a circuit like this and I have no drops of energy throughout the circuit the potential is not gonna there's not going to be any potential difference but if I now plant a light bulb here or a resi resistor or anything with a resistance then there is a drop in energy between this point and that point and therefore there will be a potential difference between them and to measure it we always chuck a voltmeter in parallel to compare those two energies and this will read however much the energy change between one point and the other right? the definition of the volt I hope you remember is how much energy is carried by each or given to each coulomb okay when we're giving energy to the coulombs we call that EMF and that's the job of this guy when the energy is given by the coulombs to the uh, uh, component for example this bulb then we call it potential difference and that's uh, the job of the electrons that go around so potential difference as I, I was just explaining right now here you have 1.5 volts of EMF in the battery and 1.5 volts therefore of potential drop through the light bulb as you can see here they indicate two points saying that the difference in energy between this point and that point is the 1.5 volts and that's what we call the potential difference In other words, there is the, it makes no sense to talk about the potential at one particular point. So you can't you can't have this uh, circuit. I'm going to draw an equivalent. They have this, right? There's a switch here, but it doesn't matter for now. Um, you can't ask what is the voltage here or the potential difference there. It doesn't make any sense. Now, if you ask what's the potential difference between here and there, then we're talking. Uh, and it makes sense to connect a voltmeter to here and to there and you can ask what it is and it's going to be the same amount as the drop through the light bulb and it will be if this guy has no resistance which in GCSE they are assumed to have very small resistance then the EMF of the battery is the energy given to the charges and the EMF of the sorry of the cell here if this is 2 volts then the energy given to every coulomb is 2 joules and as they go through they're going to give those 2 joules to the light bulb and therefore this is going to read 2 volts the cell gives 2 volts to the charge and the charge gives um, 2 volts to the bulb as it goes through Here's the voltmeter, it's connected in parallel as you can see to one part of the wire and then to the other and there's a wire in between so the charges now have uh, there's two routes, this route and that route so this is not connected in series, before the, the thing was connected in series this wire wasn't here, the, car the charge had to go like this and like that and then continue around the circuit but the bulb was over here somewhere uh, on the side, it wasn't across the, the center so, it's connected, it's comparing the energy between this point and that point and so this has 10 volts, that will measure 10 volts uh, because it's dropping only through one bulb if you had several bulbs then the drops would be shared between them we'll talk about that more in a sec we won't do this for now so I can skip this um, let's see here's an interesting idea about potential difference it's similar to, imagine the, there's a person here who's an athlete and has a certain amount of energy before starting and then every time they jump and they go through a hurdle they lose 20 joules so here they lose 20 joules and by this time they have 80 joules now they jump again and this time they have 60 joules and so forth and now here they have 40 joules so you can say that the potential difference or the energy difference between um, one point and the next for that athlete is 20 joules here you have 20, here you have 20 and here you have 20 ok that idea is very much related to the what's happening in a circuit here's the battery imagine that it gives um, 
let's see how much would be the total 0 to 0 0.5 0 0.5 to 1 1 to 1 1.5 so a total of 1.5 volts is how much EMF this battery has meaning that 1.5 joules is given to every coulomb there's 1.5 uh, volts and as the current goes through here it loses a third of it because there's three bulbs and uh, the electrons are very clever they split the energy in between three a third goes through this guy 0 0.5 volts here is dropped another third goes through this one another 0 0.5 are dropped here and then finally the last 0 0.5 here and the total of 1.5 is split between the three bulbs in other words the brightness of these three bulbs together is going to be lower than if you just had one because they have uh, less of a drop of energy less energy is being given to each of them by the electrons as it goes around and there's also less electrons going around because the total resistance of this thing is three times bigger than if there's only one bulb so there's more electrons and they also um, sorry there's less electrons and they also have to share the energy between the three so they would be quite dim compared to if you just had one of them connected to the same cell This diagram is meant to explain the idea that I was saying before, that if the EMF of the cell is 1.5 volts, i.e. the energy difference between here and here is 1.5, then the energy difference between here and here is also going to be 1.5. And I have explained that with the analogy of the uh, pump a lot of times, where you have the, the this being the energy that the water gains from the pump, uh, simulating the, e, the, 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 the cell, and then as it drops down again, this drop between here and there we call that the potential difference and they have to be equal the sum of all the potential differences and the EMF have to be equal this can be as many as as you want as many individual drops but the sum of all of them has to be equal to the EMF okay so here you could have four light bulbs and for each of them they have a little drop and the, all of them together have to add up to the EMF so here there's only one light bulb so the EMF has to be equal to the drop through the whole light, light bulb. All of the, the electrons are generous in that way they give all of their energy away to whatever is there. In a sense that's why it's dangerous to connect something that's got too much energy or too many volts to a to an instrument that, that doesn't require them. You get too much current going through them and too much uh, energy and uh, delivered to it and you get too much power and you can burn the components and damage it. That's where fuses come in and you can use them for a security to protect the, the appliance. Now you have an EMF of 1.5 volts and two batteries to, to share it with. So basically, it's what I've just been saying right now. There's, this would be 1.5 and this would be only two drops. One drop and another drop. One for each bulb and they're both equal drops because the bulbs look identical. They don't tell us that they're different. So 1.5 divided by 2 is 0 0.75 volts for each one. So these would read 0 0.75 and 0 0.75. If you have two cells like this, and so this becomes more like a battery, then if each one is 1.5, it means it's as if you had two pumps which are doing twice the amount of work so instead of raising the water up to this height it raises it twice as much all the way up to this one and now the drop the potential drops that you can get are all the way uh, down from here to here so if each of these is 1.5 then actually you have a total of 3 volts for uh, the potential dro uh, difference to, to to use up so here you would have 1.5 and there you would have 1.5 in total a drop of 3 so from this wire to that wire all of the drop needs to be done and so um, we, we can see that here you get 1.5 for each one hopefully that that is intuitive and makes sense what about now well they've given you a clue here where this is 3 volts and that's 3 volts so you know that the difference in energy the potential difference between this wire and that wire is a total of 6 volts and therefore the total of uh, EMF of these two batteries must also be 6 um, volts. So hopefully that makes sense that the total from that wire to that wire must be 6 if these two potential drops are 6 volts. 
What about now? Well, the total EMF is 9, one of the drops is 4.5, so the other drop must be the remaining 4.5. They have to add up to the total EMF of the battery. That's very easy to calculate. What's happening in this one? Well, there's two batteries, uh, two cells here, and there's one cell here. The voltmeter here is only measuring the difference in energy between this point and that point, meaning it's only measuring the EMF of these two cells. It's not measuring the EMF of this cell over here at all. Hopefully you can see that. So, what's this going to read? Well, if the total drop of potential uh, differences here are six, uh, is 6 volts, then, assuming that these three cells have the same EMF, it means that they have to be 2 and 2 and 2. And so this should read 4 volts drop between here and here. Okay, 4 volts of EMF. Now we start uh, to talk about um, circuits in parallel and I'm going to leave this to the next video because we're already on 20 minutes and uh, I, I'm going to have to explain this in a little bit more detail as a reminder of what happens when you, when you, you think about potential drops in parallel. It's a little bit counterintuitive but hopefully in series it's made sense that it's all to do with the, the drops here need to add up to the total EMF up here and so on and so forth. That should be quite easy to calculate. Okay, so I'll see you in the next video. Bye-bye.